So welcome to what is hopefully going to be the, well, not hopefully, welcome to what's going to be the final week in the series of lectures on the congruent number problem. Let's jump right into it. So last week we talked about how you might define modular forms of half integer weight. And really the thing that allows you to do this is this functional equation for big theta. Uh, that allows you to really define half integer weight modular forms for congruent subgroups that are at level a multiple of four. Uh, which is all we need, luckily. But if it wasn't for big theta, uh, we just wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do that. And in fact, big theta is going to come into play and play a pretty big role in the conclusion of the congruent number problem as well. Um, let's see here. We talked about Eisenstein series of half integer weight last time. We saw that there's really kind of two Eisenstein series, but um, you can sort of take a certain special linear combination of them and that's got kind of all the nice properties that you would want out of a single Eisenstein series. So we call that Eisenstein series H sub K over two, and it plays similar structural roles in the theory of half integer weight modular forms that ordinary Eisenstein series play in the weight uh, in the uh, theory of ordinary modular forms. And so we're going to pick up today, we're going to just talk very briefly about HECA operators or HECA operators for half integer weight. By the way, I do know, I am not ignorant, I do know that it is pronounced HECA operators. I just don't like the double vowel sound. I think that's a pain in the butt. So I've been saying HECA operators for a couple months now. Um, no disrespect to HECA. Um, so this will be the last kind of very brief knowledge-based section before we resume the attack on the congruent number problem. And what you need to realize is there's like three different ways of defining HECA operators. And I would recommend Richard Borchard's uh, series of lectures uh, on YouTube on his channel on modular forms because he kind of talks about how these operators might be motivated naturally and uh, which is not something I did I, I kept it very clinical in my treatment but you can actually show for example that if you let delta n be the set of two by two matrices of determinant n and then you look at a double coset there for some alpha and delta n then um if you define this object F bar of this double coset, gamma, alpha, gamma, sub K, as the sum over all right cosets inside this double coset of F bracket uh, alpha, gamma, sub J, where the, this, bracket, this uh, bracket notation refers to our old bracket notation that we've already developed in the past. Then in the ordinary modular form case, it turns out you can think of a heck operator acting on F as n to the k over two minus one power times the sum over all double cosets in delta n of f bracket, this new bracket double coset operation we just defined. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you that what's really going on here is, so if you take a modular form f, right? Um, so f of z is modular, right? The problem is that like f of two z isn't quite modular. It's invariant under some kind of special subgroup of SL2Z. And so what T2 of F is trying to do is by taking a sum over appropriate coset representatives within SL2Z, it kind of fixes this issue. It sort of makes F of 2Z like modular in some sense, okay? And so like T sub N of F is trying to make F of NZ into like a modular form, okay? And you can play this same game for congruent subgroups of level n uh, as long as uh, four divides n. What you can do is call delta n now, not the set of two by two matrices of determinant n, but the set of matrices of determinant n that are congruent to one star zero n, okay? Uh, mod n, mod capital N. And then you can show in that case that T sub n of f is very naturally defined to be this same kind of sum up here. n to the k over two minus one power still. And we have a very similar looking sum. It's the sum over f bracket, these, these double cosets um, where big gamma has been replaced by uh, big gamma sub one of n, okay? And the sum is still over all the double cosets in delta n. So you, you kind of mimic uh, what's true about heck operators in the general case in the congruent subgroup case as long as four divides the level. Okay, but um, that's just all the things that I've said so far are theory of ordinary modular forms. We're interested in heck operators for half integer weight modular forms. 
And you might hate what I'm about to say, but I think you might hate it even more if I gave you all the details. It turns out this interpretation, we call it the double coset uh, interpretation of the heck operator, is exactly what you need in order to define heck operators for modular forms of half an integer weight. Um, what you basically do is you define t sub n of f to be a very similar looking ugly sum. It's just there's a lot of details that go into the description that I don't want to give. Um, and this works for all, all um, modular forms in m sub k over 2 of gamma 1 of n. Okay, and I won't detail this here, but if you want to know more about that, you can just let me know. Uh, another interesting thing, though, is once you've done this for the half integer weight modular forms, you see that really you're only getting heck operators that are non-trivial if their indices are both prime to the level capital N and also perfect squares. And what I mean by that is you actually will get that T sub N of F is zero otherwise. So it's not very interesting. And so just like the T sub P, you might remember where the, where the building blocks for the T sub M in the ordinary modular form case, uh, in the sense that they generated a commutative algebra of operators, um, you might remember, along with the T sub M, M, the other types of hack operators that we haven't really used much. Um, the exact same proof will show, uh, once you take this fact into account above here, that the T sub P squared for P prime and P not dividing N are the building blocks for all the hack operators T sub N squared, where a little n and capital N are co-prime. Because again, if they're not co-prime, we're going to get a zero here. We're going to get zero contribution here. And um, if the index is not a perfect square, we also get no contribution. So that's why n squared, and that's why this co-prime condition. Uh, very much like in the integer weight case, uh, tp squared, which are our building blocks, they actually do preserve the space of modular forms of half integer weight. And as a matter of fact, in the direct sum decomposition, where you look at modular forms over uh, with respect to certain characters, you can actually show these tp squared not only preserve the entire space of half integer weight modular forms, but they preserve the individual chi components in the direct sum. Okay, so that's nice. And the last thing is, you might remember that there was a special relationship between um, kind of coefficients of T sub N of F in the ordinary modular form case. There are relationships uh, uh, between those coefficients and the coefficients of the original modular form F that you're acting on. Um, there are similar relationships that you can develop in the theory of half integer weight modular forms. Okay, so we can write these B sub N actually in terms of the A sub N, where the A sub N are the coefficients of the original modular form. Okay, and um, so you know, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is we sort of did define half integer weight modular forms correctly because a lot of the same properties that big boy modular forms had seem to be holding as well for in the half integer weight case, okay? Um, here's another thing, like here's some more uh, motivation for us. Uh, if I look at T sub M squared N squared, that's actually T sub N squared T sub M squared. In particular, these things commute just like they did in the ordinary uh, modular forms case. Now this is only true if um, N is prime to M, but that's okay because we had a similar fact in the ordinary weight case. And another thing is uh, like, T sub P to the 2V is a polynomial in T sub T sub P squared, which was something that was also true in the ordinary uh, modular forms case. So we're, you know, we're doing a, some good work. We're doing God's work here. We're defining things correctly. And the most important thing is this next theorem though. So just like in the integer case, the integer weight case, it turns out that uh, half integer weight modular forms for gamma naught of n with respect to Dirichlet characters do have a basis of eigenforms for all heck operators indexed prime to capital N. That is something that was true in the integer weight modular forms case, and it's something that we're going to need to be true moving forward. And um, the other thing is, if you, if you remember, I mean, I just said it a couple minutes ago, but uh, half integer weight modular forms can be broken down via direct sum into components that look exactly like this. So once you realize that, if you combine that with this theorem, you sort of understand that, yeah, I mean, eigenforms really do kind of form a basis of building blocks for the entire space of, of half integer weight modular forms, okay? If you just go component by component in this direct sum. Okay, so 
long story short, there are hack operators of half integer weight, and they kind of behave almost exactly like they do in the, in the integer weight case and in the congruent subgroup case. Okay, so we're now gonna go into the last section here. We're going to resume the attack on the congruent number problem. Before we do that, we had better kind of recall where we left off, right? So here's what we know so far. A square free positive integer n is congruent. If, if that's the case, then the L function of its associated elliptic curve evaluated at one is zero. This is coates wiles okay? If you assume a weak version of the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is true just for these specific elliptic curves E sub n, then the converse is true. That is, um, if the L function evaluated at one is zero, then n must be congruent in the case n is square free, okay? Uh, so it, we sort of want to study this L function, right? And we proved that, or we saw that the L function as a function of S, a complex variable, is actually a chi sub n of m, which is this Dirichlet character that's uh, given by a Legendre symbol, times b sub m, m to the negative s. This guy has coefficients. These, guy, these coefficients here are rising from a weight two cusp form for gamma naught of n, where n is 32 little n squared if little n is odd, and 16 little n squared if little n is even. And what are these b sub m's? They are actually just the very easily computable coefficients for the L function of the elliptic curve E sub one. Okay, so you kind of need to just twist them by a, by a Legendre symbol to get the L functions for all of the elliptic curves. Okay, that's about all we know so far. We're gonna continue pressing forward now that we know, every, you know everything under the sun about various types of modular forms. Uh, that was sarcastic. So we're going to begin with a theorem of Shimura, which gives a correspondence between certain half integer weight k over two forms and even integer weight k minus one forms. And here's what it says. So suppose k is bigger than or equal to three, and it's odd. And then let lambda be k minus one over two, which is a kind of a true fraction because k is odd. Or I'm sorry, which is a not a true fraction because k is odd. Okay. Uh, let's let four divided by n so that you know all this theory of half integer weight modular forms actually works. We'll let chi be a Dirichlet character mod capital N as usual. And we're going to take f to be a weight k over two cusp form uh, with respect to this character chi. Okay. And we're going to write its q expansion out um, as just you know a sub n times q to the n starting at one because it's a cusp form. And we're going to assume that this F is not only a cusp form, but it's an eigenform for all of the heck operators, T sub, P, T sub P squared, right? And we'll call the eigenvalues lambda sub P. There's one per operator. Now we're gonna define a new function, G, little g. And we're gonna give it a Q expansion starting at one, but we're gonna call its coefficients B sub N. And what are these B sub Ns? They're going to be specified by the following Euler product. I want them to be chosen so that this Dirichlet series here equals this product. And we've seen products like this in the past, like this type of product popping up uh, is no coincidence to us. It popped up in the study of the Riemann zeta function. It popped up in the study of various L functions and in the study of the discriminant, for example. So uh, this looks like a really weird way to determine these coefficients B sub n, but you can actually show that this information here is enough to actually compute the B sub n's. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but you get expressions for the B sub n's in terms of these eigenvalues, actually, and in terms of this character chi, of course. Um, so these coefficients are computable. This is not just some like abstract, you know, formula that we're not going to be able to do anything with and we're never going to be able to check. We can actually use this to compute these coefficients. Um, then it turns out G is actually a weight K minus one modular form with respect to chi squared of level capital N over two. Um, I wanna emphasize though that in Shimura's original theorem, this capital N over two was not known. And it is a separate theorem that, um, the, that this level here can be chosen to be capital N over two. And it's not so easy actually of a theorem, okay. And in addition, if K happens to be not only bigger than or equal to three, but bigger than or equal to five, then G is a cusp form, not just a modular form. And so what does this give us? This gives us a map from the starting F to this guy G, and we call this the Shimura map. And what is it doing? It's kind of like taking eigenforms at half integer weight to, to 
uh, eigenforms, eigenforms that are cusp forms with respect to characters of half integer weight to actual cusp forms of uh, like ordinary cusp forms that are not of half integer weight. So we get a nice correspondence there. And um, just keep in mind a priori, I mean, this is not like an injective map or anything just right off the bat, multiple Fs could certainly go to the same G. Okay, let me give you an example of this in action, although this is not something that we will need. Um, let's say you take capital N to be four and chi to be the trivial character. By choosing it to be the trivial character, you get the entire space of modular forms here instead of just kind of one component of the direct sum. Um, it's a standard fact. In fact, we may have even talked about it that the first non-zero cusp form of half integer weight occurs at k equals nine. And if k equals nine, you can see here that lambda is going to be four, okay? As a matter of fact, we actually know what this cusp form is. It's big theta times big F times big theta to the fourth minus 16 F. And what is this F? Uh, I defined it last time. It's a very special modular form. Uh, it's the sum over uh, odd positive integers of sigma one of N Q to the N, where you might recall that sigma one of N is just adding up the divisors of N, okay? And big theta, we know. Big theta is uh, sum over the integers of Q to the N squared, okay? Um, now, it also happens to be true that this eigenform here, uh, that I'm sorry, that this cusp form here is actually an eigenform for LTP squared. And it's also true, you know, we're working at level four here. It's also true that half integer weight cusp forms at level four is a one dimensional space. Okay, but then under the Shimura correspondence, our G has to be a cusp form of level two and weight eight for gamma naught of four. And I'll, I'll have you check this. This is trivial just based on the Shimura map theorem, okay? But, <laughs> but the space of such cusp forms by a previous proposition is one dimensional and it's actually spanned by eta of z, eta of two z all to the eighth power. So what that's telling us is that the image of this guy under the Shimura map is this modular form here, eta z times eta of two z to the eighth, maybe up to constant multiple, right? And using the Shimura map, you can actually compute the coefficients of this guy explicitly in terms of the eigenvalues, which is just bizarre, right? I mean, this is the connections between these various kind of canonical modular forms are wild. The discriminant, the Eisenstein series, the eta function, the theta function, the capital F function, they all have these really strange relationships uh, with each other. And, and here's one of them. OK, so that's one example of the Shimura map in action. Um, of course, you know, you can extend the Shimura map linearly, right? Um, so what you can do is you can take a basis of eigenforms for this space here, which you know exists by a theorem. And then you can just tell me what Shimura does to each basis element and extend linearly thanks to that in the obvious way. Okay, so like if fi goes to gi, then if I'm taking the sum of a sub i, f sub i, and I want to I want to know what Shimura does to that, I can just take the sum of a sub i, g of i. Um, so, so let's keep going here. We're going to define a new little space here that we're only going to kind of temporarily use. We're going to define M sub K over two plus of gamma naught of four. It's going to be the subspace of M sub K of gamma naught over four of modular forms that have, that start at zero. So they're not necessarily cusp forms, but we're going to say that A sub N is zero. So these are cusp forms. Um, exactly when negative one to the lambda times n is two or three mod four, okay? And interestingly enough, it's not very hard to show that uh, our very interesting half integer weight Eisenstein series, h sub k over two actually lives here. And also big theta of z times f of four z lives here, provided f lives in a certain space of modular forms, okay? m sub k minus one over two gamma, the full space gamma. But, um, even more interestingly is not only do those functions live there, but as a matter of fact, M sub K over two plus is actually the span of this Eisenstein series, direct sum with the cusp forms that live here, okay? And in addition to that, this plus space is preserved by all the heck operators, except for the really problematic T sub four. But Conan came along and showed that you can modify this T sub four to give a T sub four plus 
uh, and it's a very slight modification to T sub four. It's also very natural. And that new T sub four will preserve this space. And as a matter of fact, it will even preserve the subspace of cusp forms. And furthermore, H sub K over two is an eigenform for that T sub four plus. So it's like you just slightly change this problematic T sub four and all the properties that you want to, to still be intact are left intact by doing this, okay? And um, not only that, but this subspace uh, M sub K two plus still has a basis of eigenforms for all the T sub P squared and now for T sub four plus. So we fix the issue. And as a matter of fact, that basis is unique up to permutation and scalar multiplication in the space of cusp forms. So it's just like you make this tiny slight modification to your problem child and everything stays intact. So that's good. Um, and what that allows you to do is conclude the following miracle. So let's say F is one of these eigenforms, okay? Uh, in, this, in this basis here. Now you can look at the image of that under the Shimura map, right? It miraculously turns out that that image actually lives in S sub K minus one of the full SL2Z. And I wanna emphasize how miraculous that is because even Shimura's theorem doesn't put it there. Shimura's theorem just puts it in, uh, it, it just makes it a cusp form of weight K minus one for a congruent subgroup at level two, right? That's, this is much better than that, okay? Not only that, all of these Gs here happen to be distinct. So if I choose a different basis element, I get a distinct image under the Shimura map. It's like, wow, I mean, what else could you ask for? And not only that, all these images are normalized eigenforms for all T sub n. And so what that shows you in particular you can derive from this that, and this is a huge theorem, M sub K over two plus at level four is isomorphic to M sub K minus one for the full group SL2Z. And this isomorphism respects cusp forms. It's still true if you move down to cusp forms. As a matter of fact, um, even more than that is true. So not only is this isomorphism a thing, but you also get a, the following commutative diagram. So. You, um, so let me take M sub K over two plus. I didn't know how to tech commutative diagrams when I made these notes. Otherwise I would have included this. Maybe I will put it in the notes now that I've learned how to do that. Um, so let's, let's, this is the Shimura map here. Okay, so let me, let me write that in. So this is Shimura and that sends me uh, to, to via an isomorphism to M sub K minus one of the full group SL2Z. So not only do you have this isomorphism, but you get the following commutative diagram as well. You can, um, you can send like F here to TP squared of F, right? And that gives you something, right? Gives you something here, okay? And then over here, you can send whatever function G to TP of G. Okay, and this diagram commutes. It's just, it's wild, man. I mean, this is, this is so, the Shimura map doesn't give you any of this, right? I mean, this takes a lot more work to get, okay? So I just want you to realize, in fact, you know this is a deep result because guess what theorem it uses? You need a Bayes converse theorem, which was a deep theorem from earlier, if you recall, okay? So there's some really weird stuff going on here. Now, what you do next is this. So, uh, Take one, of the, take one of these Gs here in the target of this isomorphism, okay? And write down a Q expansion for it, okay? Uh, okay? I guess I should put one, right? Okay, now let chi sub D be the following character. It's gonna be the canonical character attached to the quadratic field of discriminant D, which remember is this kind of extension of the Legendre symbol character that I got stuck on last time, okay? And now suppose negative one to the lambda d is bigger than zero, and we're gonna let L sub g of chi d of s denote as before the analytic continuation of the Dirichlet series corresponding to this character, okay? So it's gonna basically take g and it's gonna twist the coefficients by this canonical character, 
Okay. And it's easy to show, you know, using the standard, you know, Dirichlet series theory, whatever, this guy converges on at least the right half plane real of S bigger than K over two. Okay, that's not hard to show. Now, uh, so you've got one of these guys in the target, right, under this isomorphism. Now take one of the Fs, whoa, what happened? Okay, take one of the Fs that maps to that under the Shimura map. So you've got some cusp form of weight K over two in this space S of K over two plus, and we'll give it a Q expansion and we'll call those coefficients A sub N, okay? Um, just like before, it's the exact same definition. You can define a Peterson inner product on these spaces for half integer weight spaces, okay? And it's defined the same way as it was for the, uh, the full group. It's like, if you wanna do, you know, F, uh, inner product with itself, you'll do one over this index, six, which is six in this case, the integral over the fundamental domain for this space that you're working on of absolute value of F squared, which is like FF bar, right? And then this same kind of Y to the K over two DX DY over Y squared, which is like this invariance factor. It's this factor here that allows us to move between different fundamental domains and guarantee that this integral is independent of choice of fundamental domain, okay? Um, don't worry too much about that. There's basically, there's an inner product also on the half integer weight spaces of modular forms, not just on the, you know, not just on the, the generic ordinary modular form spaces. So the next goal is this. You want to somehow use the Peterson inner product to relate the so-called critical values of this L function here, okay, to the coefficients of F. So it's like, what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to relate relevant information about G in the image of the Shimura map and its L function at special values, which are called critical values, which I'll talk about in a moment, to the actual coefficients of the, of the modular form that maps to it under Shimura, okay? Um, the tool that you need for this is Waldsberger's theorem and it is highly, highly non-trivial. It's not even easy to state the theorem. Uh, luckily, you don't, actually need the full theorem. If you go and go in Wikipedia Waldsberg's theorem, you'll see exactly why. I'm not even gonna state the theorem. I'm just gonna kind of describe to you what it does, okay? Um, and, and again, just keep in mind, we only actually really need kind of a weak version of the theorem. Um, what does this theorem do? I won't state it, but I'll just tell you what it does. Well, Waldsberger's theorem is trying to do, it's a theorem from representation theory, and it's trying to, to take like a modular form of weight K minus one and two Z, for example, and relate the critical values of its L series, which is you know, kind of what we're trying to do here, to the Q coefficients of the F mapping to it under Shimura. Okay, so it's, it's a theorem that's doing exactly what we said we wanted it to do. Now, I'm gonna show you two weak versions of Waldsberger, one of which we're not going to use, but which will show you exactly what's going on and then I will also give you a version that we are going to use, okay? So let me give you a version of Waldsberger that we're not going to use first. It's called Conan Zagie. Um, and here's what it says. Using all the notation above, so this L function is defined, you know, um, uh, like this up here. So this is L sub G of chi D. Okay, so it's like the twisting of, of the Q expansion of G by this, this uh, this discriminant character chi sub d, and then we, instead of looking at a Q expansion, we're looking at a Dirichlet series. So we get in like kind of like an L function, like a twisted L function of, of G, okay? Uh, it turns out that if you evaluate that at lambda, and what is lambda? Lambda, remember, is, um, I sh I'll just write it here. Remember that lambda is K minus one over two, okay? It turns out that if you evaluate that L function at lambda, you get this you get pi over uh, absolute value of the discriminant to the K power times radical of the absolute value of the discriminant over K minus one factorial. And then here's where the Peterson inner product comes in. You take G inner product with itself divided by F inner product with itself. And then here are these coefficients. Here are these coefficients from F popping up. Um, you can actually, these coefficients are of index well, there's a special coefficient, I guess we're focusing on, right? It's the coefficient with index absolute value of the discriminant and then squared. Now, is this, first you gotta realize this value is independent of the choice of basis in the Shimura map in the source, okay? But 
the second thing you might be asking yourself, is this actually doing what you said uh, we wanted it to do? You said Waldsberger was supposed to relate like a certain coefficient or coefficients of S, F, which we have here, to critical values of the L function of G, the image of F. How do we know this is a critical value? Well, let's recall what a critical value is. So, so for example, take the Riemann zeta function, okay? We know the Riemann zeta function evaluated at S is related to the zeta function evaluated at one minus S with so-called critical strip, uh, the real part of S between zero and one. And we also had a functional equation for the L functions of E sub N, right? Those L of E sub N evaluated at S was related to L of E sub N evaluated at two minus S, giving it a critical strip zero real part of S, uh, real part of S between zero and two. And so what do we mean by critical value? We mean a value that um, of an L function at an integer inside of a critical strip. So for example, L of E sub N one is a critical value because one is an integer, right? And uh, it lies in this critical strip here. It's between zero and two. So that's all I mean by critical value, integer value in a critical strip. And what is a critical strip? Uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but it's like the strip in which all of the non-trivial action happens. It's like outside the strip, either the continuation is understood or the, the function itself is understood as like a series that converges. Okay, so you, it's, the, it's the strip where everything non-trivial is happening. Okay, so, so why is Conan Zagier actually doing what we said Waldsberger does? Um, you do need a theorem to see this, and here's the theorem. Uh, so let G be a weight K minus one modular form for SL2Z, and then consider its twisted L function, okay? Then that twisted L function has a functional equation that relates it to that same L function evaluated not at S, but at K minus one minus S, okay? The second you know this, you see that Conan Zagier, this is actually a critical value. Because what's lambda, right? Lambda is k minus one over two. This functional equation tells me what? It tells me that the critical strip of L sub G is going to be zero less than real part of S less than k minus one. But look, this is an integer value, right? Because k is odd. And furthermore, it lives in the critical strip. As a matter of fact, this is not just any critical value here. This is the central critical value in the strip, right? Because I have zero, I have K minus one, what's halfway right in between that? The integer value K minus one over two, right? Okay, so yes, Conan Zagier is doing exactly what we said it should do. Relating critical functions of L, Twisted L functions of modular forms in the image of Shimura to coefficients of the modular form that map uh, that maps to that under the Shimura map. Okay, uh, I can even give you a concrete example. So, the first non-zero space of cusp forms for SL2Z, as we saw, is uh, uh, S12, and that's generated by the discriminant modular form. Okay, as a vector space. Um, in our context, that would happen when k equals 13, okay? And, uh, and so lambda would be six because lambda is k minus one over two, right? You gotta think of, of 12 here as like k minus one, okay, to have this discussion up here. Um, so because S12 is only kind of one dimensional here, it has to be the case that G is like uh, delta up to complex multiplication, right? You have no other option. And it can actually be shown that the modular form that maps to G under Shimura is, of course, it's this polynomial in big theta and big F. It's big theta times big F times big theta minus 16 F times big theta to the fourth minus two F. Okay, and I you know I again recall here the definitions of capital F and big theta, which I won't do again. Um, so there you go. So there's a kind of a concrete example of, of this happening, okay, of, the, of this working in action. So what would what would Conan Zagier say? It would say that the L function of this very important modular form, the discriminant, has twisted coefficients that are very intimately related to coefficients of this modular form here, which is just, again, like, why? I mean, why should this be true? No idea, and I don't think many people do, 
because I've, I've talked to people that are pretty well up there in, in, in modular forms and you talk to just about anybody and modular forms are just this magical thing that, that we just don't really fully understand yet. And I'll say more about that later. Um, okay, so so that's Conan Zaghi and that Conan Zaghi is not the version of, of Waldsbergers that we need. It just, it very explicitly kind of shows you this relationship that I was talking about that Waldsberger is supposed to be facilitating, okay? So uh, there is a version of Waldsberger that we do need though for the congruent number problem. And before I tell you that, it's worth asking the question like where else can we even apply Waldsberger's theorem? Well, where else do we know we have non-zero ordinary cusp forms? Go back up here. Isn't that kind of where we left off in the congruent number problem? Don't we have some kind of uh, you know, non-trivial cusp form at level capital M associated to the L functions of our congruent number elliptic curves? Yes, we do. It's right here, okay? So we have one. So maybe Waldsberger and Shimura can help us do something with that. And um, so here's a proposition about this cusp form. So let G, let, let's give it a, co, uh, a Q expansion. Okay, B sub M Q to the M. Let G be the um, cusp form associated to the L function of E1, okay, which we know is a weight two cusp form. Then, and we already know this, then G is a weight two cusp form at level 32. We already know that. But here, crucially, here's the new fact about that cusp form. It is a normalized eigenform for all heck operators. And as a matter of fact, it's a new form and it's the unique new form that satisfies this property. Like, of course, right? Of course, all of this is true. And why does this matter? This matters because the second it's a normalized eigenform for heck operators, we get access to the Shimura map, okay? Because the Shimura map and Waldsberger play really well with these, these bases of eigenforms, okay? Um, let's make another critical realization though. You know, um, uh, if I, so, so how do I want to present this? Okay. So, so let N be a square free integer. Okay. And let capital D be negative N if negative N is one mod four and negative four N if negative N is two or three mod four. In other words, let capital D be the discriminant of the imaginary quadratic field Q adjoins square root of negative n, okay? What does that mean? So that means the following. We know already that the L function of E1 is the same thing as the L function of G. That's where we left off with in our discussion of the congruent number problem. And here's the coefficient, Here, here's, the, here's the Dirichlet series, okay? Now, we also already know that the L function of E sub n is a twist of this guy by the Legendre symbol character. But it turns out, and it's actually easy to see this, I left it as an exercise, you can replace chi sub n, the genre symbol character, by this canonical character chi sub d. So in other words, L, the L function of en is actually the twisted L function by chi sub d of g, which is sum one to infinity, not of chi sub n of m, but of chi sub d of m times b sub m, m to the negative s. Okay, and that's a crucial observation that you have to make at some point, okay, in, in some of the proofs coming up. And so let me give you a little bit of an idea why that's true um, in the form of an exercise. So uh, go look at your L function of E1. The first thing you want to show is that these coefficients are actually zero unless M is one mod four. It's not hard to show that, okay? So show that and then use this fact to show that chi sub n and chi sub d are actually the same on every m such that b sub m is non-zero, which is, you know, m's that are not one mod four, okay? Uh, and so hence, chi sub n can indeed be replaced by chi sub d as claimed above, okay? All right, now let's hit the congruent number theorem with all that we have. We, we've, we're, we're gonna use Shimura, we're gonna use Waldsberger, to basically kind of pull, uh, we're gonna try to kind of relate the critical values of this L function here of our cusp form that comes from, from the L functions of E sub n to their pre-images under the Shimura map. And the thing that's letting us do that is Waldsberger combined with the fact that this G is actually a normalized eigenform for a heck operator so that the question makes sense in the first place. Okay, so here's, all right, so just this now it gets, 
crazy again. I mean, if it wasn't already crazy, it's going to get crazier. So here's what, let's, let's just recall. Uh, what do we know about Le1 so far? We know Len of 1 vanishes if and only if n is congruent, assuming the weak BSD conjecture holds for these elliptic curves. We already know this. Now, here's the thing. It turns out a weak version of Waldsberger gives you a means of describing this value here, thanks to the Shimura map. So here, here's what happens. Look at this. Let beta be the real period of E sub one, which is really just like, you can take a real period of any elliptic curve. So you just integrate from one to infinity dx over kind of the square root of the right-hand side of the elliptic curve. Okay, and this is gonna be some finite value. Okay. And in, in the case of E1, it's about 2.622. So here's a theorem from Tunnel, and here, here's what it says. Okay, there have to exist modular forms f and f prime, both of level 128, right, which is a multiple of four. Um, both of the, they're both cusp forms of weight three halves for gamma naught, although the second guy f prime, okay, is actually a modular form with respect to the character the character chi sub two, which is the you know. It's the standard Legendre symbol character, okay? Um, so there have to exist two forms, F and F prime, uh, at that level of those of that weight, cusp forms. Let me write out their, their Q expansions. Let me give F coefficients A sub M, and let me give F prime coefficients A sub M prime, okay? Such that if G is our you know, cusp form associated to E1, then these, these F and F prime actually both map to G under Shimura, first of all. And second of all, if I give G, um, we've, we've already given G coefficients B sub M, then the following is true. The L function of E sub N evaluated at one has an actual formula. And what it is, is it's beta, this real period, over four radical n times a sub n squared. So I'm pulling from f here in the case little n is odd. Or in the case little n is even, it's beta over two radical n. And then not times a prime sub n squared, but a prime sub n over two squared. Okay. So what does this tell us? This tells me my L function evaluated at one is zero if and only if a sub n is zero for this modular form, if n is odd, or if a prime sub n over two is zero, if n is even. So continuing to attack the congruent number problem is exactly the same thing as trying to figure out when these specific coefficients of these two modular forms are zero, depending on whether or not you're even or odd, okay? So I mean, this is huge, right? It's also just out of nowhere, like modular forms just come out of absolutely nowhere and help us solve a basic geometry problem about triangles. I mean, I guess like it's, it's just wicked. I mean, it's, it's very wild. And again, I'm gonna talk more about this later, but okay, I'm actually gonna sketch the proof of this because the statement is not enough to finish solving the congruent number problem, you actually need to know what F and F prime are and the theorem itself is not stating that for us. So let me sketch the proof for you, it won't take long. Um, so here's what you do, you start with your G, your cusp form associated to L of E1, okay? Uh, and the first goal is to try to find all of the weight three halves cusp forms that map to G under the Shimura map, okay? The first thing you prove is that they all have to have level 128. It's actually not that hard to prove that. Um, but then a lot of the rest of the stuff is pretty tricky. So the next thing you have to show is that chi has to be even, okay, which means it sends negative one to one. And it has to have a conductor dividing 128, okay? But then you can show right after that that not only is chi even, but when you square it, you have to get the identity character, which gives you two choices, right? Either chi is just the identity character itself or it's chi sub two, okay, which is the Legendre symbol character. Uh, the next thing you show is that there are two forms of each type, okay, of each type here corresponding to the two different types of characters. 
Okay, so there's kind of two pre-images of each type under the Shimura map. Living in, you know, weight three half cusp forms at level 128 with respect to one of these two characters. Um, this should just be chi sub triv, I guess. So fine. Okay. Um, then you prove that each one of those four can be constructed by taking some weight one modular form and multiplying by a weight one half modular form of which type. Can you guess which type? A scaled version of big theta, theta of mz. So you're taking some weight one f1 and you're multiplying by some big theta of mz. Okay, it's not hard to show. In fact, I think we have the propositions to show this that big theta of mz actually is a one half weight cusp form of level 4m with respect to the character chi sub m. Okay, um, and so if I take my F1 of weight one here and I multiply by that, what will happen? I will get something that is weight three halves because it'll be weight one plus one half, okay, of level 128 with respect to, this takes a little bit of work to show, but I think there's actually a previous proposition that we have that lets us see this with respect to this weird character, um, chi, chi sub negative one, chi sub m. And um, I did define chi sub one earlier in the notes. That's the only character here that you don't is not written in front of us. I actually thought I fixed that and put that here. Um, let me just, if it takes me under a minute, then I'll just try to find that and remind you what it was. If I can't find it in under a minute, we'll just keep going. Let's see, where was chi sub negative one? It was right around here somewhere, eh? Because mm, I think we talked about it last time, so it's gotta be, yeah, here it is. So uh, chi sub negative one is this negative one to the n minus one over two character. Okay, so I need to go back down here and make sure that that's included in the notes for you guys when I send these out. Um, where are we? Okay. Um, where 4m of course has to divide 128 or else this just isn't gonna be true, right? Um, now, once you realize this, you can sort of like algorithmically deduce what F1 has to be. And here's what it has to be. F1 has to be big theta minus big theta of Z minus big theta of 4Z all times big theta of 32Z minus one half big theta of 8Z, which you can show lives uh, is a weight one modular form at level 128 with respect to this character here, chi sub negative one, chi sub two. The next thing you do is you show that F, um, you show that F1 is a cusp form, okay? Um, or I'm sorry, not F1. You show that this guy is a cusp form, excuse me. So right now we only know it's a modular form, but as a matter of fact, it's a cusp form of weight three halves. So F1 times big theta of MZ actually is a weight three halves cusp form at level 128 with respect to the character chi sub 2M. Um, you can show that in the case chi is a, uh, in the case that you're working with cusp forms, this character here is the same as this character here. It's actually not hard. I think you might even have enough to do that with our propositions. Um, we don't need this, but this is actually cute. You can actually show F1 is eta of 8z times eta of 16z. We don't need that to be true, but you know, of course something like that must be true because it seems like every bizarre coincidence possible is happening here. Okay. And then uh, Tunnel kind of proves like a sub theorem within his theorem here. Um, and it's as follows. So F1 times big theta of 2z, F1 times big theta of 8z are weight three halves cusp forms at level 128. And F1 times big theta 4z and F1 times big theta 16z are weight three cusp, three halves cusp forms at level 128 with respect to chi sub two. And these four forms are a maximally linearly independent set of eigenforms for all the T sub P squared, whose Shimura image is this G, you know, this, this cusp form G corresponding to our L function for E sub one. Now, um, you're not done yet because you have four options, right? And Tunnel's theorem says, I should only be picking like two of these that do what I want. So which two of the four, you know, do we, are, are we supposed to be considering? Um, this is where Waldsberger's theorem comes in. So 
uh, tunnel applies a, a weak version of Waldsberger's theorem that is not Conan Zaghi, but some other kind of weak version of Waldsberger's theorem to figure out that um, the correct choices among these four are f sub one times big theta of two z and f sub one times big theta of four z. So one from each space, and it's the one that has the smaller um, scaling of z. Okay. Now, I've already told we, you know what big theta is. There's an explicit formula for it. So it's e very easily it's very easy to write down an expression for big theta of two z and big theta of four z. But you know, in addition, I told you what f one was as well, right? F1 is this guy here, which also incidentally happens to be this eta function, but we don't care about that. We care about this version of F1. So you can actually explicitly write down F and F prime then in terms of nothing but big theta. And I told you guys weeks ago this was going to happen. I told you that big theta was going to be the, the Lord and Savior here, so to speak. Um, if you plug this expression in for F1, here's what you get for F of Z and F prime of Z. F of Z is big theta Z minus big theta four Z all times big theta of 32 Z minus one half big theta of eight Z all times big theta of two Z. And then F prime isn't much different. All that you do is you change this big theta of two Z to a big theta of four Z and everything else is the same, okay? So we have got a hold of these two forms that map to our cusp form associated to L of E1 under the Shimura map. And that's not all they do. They have a special coefficient each that is zero if and only if the L function of E sub N evaluated at one is zero, which is the exact condition that we're appealing to um, in our current state of, of affairs in the congruent number problem. So let's go back to the congruent number problem. Go back to the statement of Tunnel's first theorem. I gave you two theorems of Tunnel, although they're really just kind of one big theorem. And notice that we're only interested in the odd index coefficients of f and f prime, because remember in the congruent number problem, n without loss of generality is square free. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go back up here to this theorem. Here, if n is odd, then of course a sub n is an odd index coefficient of f just because n is odd. But if n is even, we're supposed to be looking at a prime sub n over two, right? Okay, but n is square free. So n over two has to be odd. So what I'm saying is in both cases, this index is odd. If we're assuming n is square free, which is what we're doing for the congruent number problem, okay? So, uh, but that's, I mean, that turns out to be a crucial observation because it's now trivial by the definition of big theta, essentially, that if m is odd, the mth coefficients of the above two functions are essentially the same as if you kind of killed off this big theta of 4z here. Because look, I mean, that just follows from the distributive property and the definition of big theta, right? If I distribute big theta of 4z to all this here, I'm only going to get even index coefficients, right? Because all these scale factors are even here. And the same thing happens down here. So just write it out if you don't believe me. Okay. So I'm because of this, because of the fact that n is square free, I'm allowed to kill off these big theta of four z's. And just consider um, the mth coefficients of, of this kind of modified version of f and f prime without the, the big theta of four z there. Okay, and now we come to really the, the, the climax here. So but you can just explicitly write these out, right? I mean, you know the definition of big theta, which means you instantly know the big definition of all the rest of these pieces. If you write it out, here's what you get. This modified, we'll call this F modified, and we'll call this F prime modified. If you write out F modified, here's what you get. Because remember, just what is this all just comes from big theta is sum of Q to the N squared, summing over Z. What will this be? Write it all out, and you're going to get that this is the sum over triples x, y, z in the integers of q to the n squared. But n squared in this case is what? It's 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared in the exponent minus 1 half 
times the same sum over triples of q to the what? 2x squared plus y squared plus 8z squared. Okay, just believe me, this is totally trivial. There's nothing to check here. I'm not saying anything profound. Okay, now do the same thing for f prime. You can play the same game. The only thing that happens is this two changes to a four, right? So that means these twos up here have to change to fours. Okay, but uh, what happens if you, <laughs> so this is, this is it, right? We're, we're there now. What happens if you collect Q to the N coefficients? Well, if N is odd, right? Then according to Tunnel's theorem, L, you know what, this should say one, right? L of E sub N evaluated at one, let's go back up, let's just make sure we're on the same page, is a constant multiple of the square of A sub N, right? What, which is the, which is the nth coefficient of the Q expansion? Which is the nth coefficient on the right-hand side of this expression here? Because we didn't modify coefficient, uh, odd index coefficients by dropping these theta of four Zs, right? So L of E sub N of one is a constant multiple, if N is odd, of the nth coefficient of this guy. And what is that coefficient? What is the nth coefficient of this? If you do, this is, this is everything. If you don't realize this, you can't finish. What is the nth coefficient of this? It's the number of solutions to 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared equals n, the power that you want, minus one half the number of solutions to 2x squared plus y squared plus 8z squared equals n. And the same idea holds if n is even, it's just that you need to use the second equation now. And you have to replace n by n over two, right? Because uh, in Tunnel's theorem, n is replaced by n over two when n is even. Okay, but so what does that tell us, right? N is congruent though, if and only if this coefficient is zero. So, so what? So this tells me that, um, so, so this tells me that this nth coefficient that I'm after, which is, so let me write it all out. Let me write it out in the case a little n is odd. This tells me that a sub n on the one hand is the number of solutions to 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared equals n over, over triples in the integers, in the integers, which is crucial, okay? Minus one half the number of solutions to 2x squared plus y squared equal, uh, plus 8z squared equals n, again, over the integers. On the other hand, this is zero if and only if L of E sub N one is zero by tunnel and by, this, and by the previous state of affairs of the congruent number problem. But if A sub N is zero, if and only if this happens, what can you do if this expression is zero? You can add this to the other side, right? And what you end up with is tunnel's congruent number theorem, which says the following. Suppose n is a square free odd integer. Then n is congruent if and only if the number of solutions to 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared equals n equals, because you can add this over, one half the number of solutions over the integers to 2x squared plus y squared plus 8z squared equals n. And if n is even, you just have to modify this a little bit. You just have to change these n's, as we already discussed, to n over twos. And you have to change these twos to fours. Just, and that just comes out of the equations for f and f prime. That's not a big deal. And the reverse implications, of course, require that the weak Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture be true when applied to use of n. So is this it? Is this the thing we've been looking for? Is this the characterization of congruent numbers that's finally checkable after all this time? Let's look. Initially, testing whether or not a square free number or just any number is congruent 
seems to require an infinite check on triples of rational numbers subject to two constraints. Right triangleness and area endness. Okay, but it seemed and it seems surprising you could ever come up with a set of criteria that was checkable in finite time, let alone basically instantly. But I'm claiming these are those criteria that you're looking for. Because the, these, look at this. We're only trying to solve these equations over the integers, right? Not over the rationals, not like not over some big set, just the integers. How do you check this cardinality of these sets? Well, I don't know how you check it exactly, but I sure know how you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, algorithmically, but I sure know how you check it by brute force. All you have to do is restrict X, Y, and Z individually be, to be between negative radical N and radical N, right? If they're outside that range, they're not solving this equation because of these quadratic terms here. So what you need to do to check if a number is congruent is let's say it's odd. You need to take these two equations over the integers, count how many solutions they have. And how do you do that? You have a computer only check integer values, x, y, and z, each between radical n and, radi and negative radical n. A computer can do that in like instantly, right? I mean, if n is huge, maybe not. But if n is less than a billion, I mean, okay, if n is less than a million, you're good. And if, if n is huge, I mean, you just need a better computer, right? I mean, the whole point is this is algorithmic and checkable. And this is, this is just crazy, right? I mean, what do these equations have anything to do with congruent numbers? I mean, nothing on the, on the face of it. But, um, but we've done what we set out to do, which is wild. And I, I just, I wanna say some more things here. This is the problem with modular forms is like, they seem to come out of absolutely nowhere and solve these wild number theory problem, not even just number theory problems, topology problems, algebra problems. And we don't, we don't know why, we don't know when to expect them. And they sort of leave just as quickly as they come. They come in, they solve this crucial part of your problem for you, and then they're just gone. Then they just leave. They don't show up in the rest of the solution. And furthermore, it's I view it's kind of like proving something by induction in the sense that you don't really get a sense for why what you're doing is true. It's like you proved the result, but you have no idea why it's true. It's true because modular forms, they're very magical. I mean, look, I'll just give you some examples of other problems where modular forms pop up and save the day. Optimal sphere packing in dimensions eight and 24 has been solved thanks to modular forms. And it doesn't appear to work in any other dimensions. The modularity theorem of Wiles, the congruent number problem, uh, you can prove Picard's theorem. The shortest, the best proof of Picard's theorem uses the J invariant, which is a modular function of weight zero. It's like a two line proof or three line proof once you know the basic properties of J. I mean, the monster group and its connection to the moonshine, to, to the monstrous moonshine conjecture. That's another place where, like, okay, I guess modular forms are somehow related to the monster group because they are. So it's kind of disturbing to me. I mean, we don't really understand. There's clearly something that's not understood here. And I'm, I'm a low level nobody, but I'm not, I'm puppeting a lot of people when I say this. I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, I mean, you have Richard Borchards and other people themselves saying, we just don't really understand modular forms and where they come from and why they're doing what they're doing, okay? And okay, so that's my little spiel on how weird modular forms are. I'd like to end by summarizing the key steps and you can print off this last page or two here and carry it around and impress all your friends because I put all the key steps down. I'm gonna recall all the major steps of the congruent number theorem proof and so you can go impress everybody. Okay, um, I just wanna note before I get into this that each equivalence relies on the previous step. Okay, so there's first there's the elementary step. A without loss of generality square free natural number is congruent if and only if there's a real number X such that x and x plus or minus n are all squares of rationals. That's just algebraic manipulation that high schoolers could do. Then we move to the connection to elliptic curves, which says that a square free natural number n is congruent if and only if the associated elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed minus n squared x has a rational solution x comma y, such that x has an even denominator and is the square of a rational number. 
then we get, we then we start involving a little bit more machinery here. So we connect the problem to the rank of an elliptic curve. A square free natural number n is congruent if and only if the uh, there are infinitely many rational solutions to its elliptic curve. Okay. In other words, the rank is positive of the elliptic curve. Then we move from the elliptic curve to its L function. A square free natural number n is congruent if and only if its L function, or more precisely, the analytic continuation of its L function, uh, or, uh, evaluated at one equals zero. Okay, and uh, where one direction needs a weak version of the BSD conjecture to be true just for these elliptic curves E sub n. Okay. Okay. Then we connect this to ordinary cusp forms. Okay. So for a natural number n, it turns out the L function of these elliptic curves E sub n is actually the twist of the L function of L of E sub 1 of s by the Legendre symbol character chi sub n. And these coefficients actually arise from a unique cusp new form of weight two at level capital N of the uh, congruent subgroup gamma naught of N, where big N is 32 little N squared if little N is odd and 16 little N squared if N is even. And like I said, chi sub N is the Legendre symbol character. And these B sub Ms are the very easily computable by hand uh, coefficients of L of E sub one. And furthermore, this chi sub n uh, can actually be replaced by the canonical character attached to the imaginary quadratic number field q adjoined square root of negative n, which is something you might think we didn't explicitly use, but it comes up in some proofs of some things, so you'll have to trust me there. In addition, g is the unique normalized eigenform for all associated heck operators t sub n uh, in this, for this uh, congruent subgroup here. And, uh, that gives us access to the Shimura map and to Waldsberger's theorem, okay? And then there's the connection to half integer weight modern forms. So this is kind of the connection to ordinary cusp forms, but we can actually connect all this to half integer weight forms, which is Tunnel's theorem. So I can find these two functions in, that are just kind of polynomials in big theta that are weight three half cusp forms at level 128 with respect to certain characters such that uh, they map to my cusp form associated to my L function under the Shimura map. And in addition, the L function that, I'm, that I care about being zero, the L function of my elliptic curve E sub n evaluated at one, that value is actually just a constant multiple of a specific coefficient in the Q expansions of these forms, depending on whether or not n is even or odd, you'll look at a different form, okay? Um, so in particular, a square free natural number n is congruent if and only if a sub n is zero for n odd or a prime sub n over two is zero for n even, okay? And those, those are just coefficients of, of the Q expansions of these forms. And then we arrive at the actual checkable equivalence, which says that if you have a square free natural number that's odd, then it's congruent if and only if the number of integer solutions to the equation n equals 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared is one half the number of integer solutions to n equals 2x squared plus y squared plus 8z squared. And if n is even, you just modify the equations a little bit and you get the exact same type of thing. And of course, I will remind you all one last time that this direction does require a weak version of the BSD conjecture to be true, only when applied to our elliptic curves E sub n. Okay. So thank you all very much for entertaining my musings for nine weeks. Um, I do have a couple of series of talks planned, but I'm gonna take a break okay, for a little while and focus on my studies and focus on finishing the semester up strong as a professor. Um, but I do very much appreciate everybody who attended. Uh, I'm gonna organize all these videos into a YouTube playlist. Right now they're kind of just scattered videos on my channel. I'll put them all in a playlist. I'll send you the link. I'll correct my notes. I will send you the full notes and I'm happy to answer any questions you have now or any questions you have in the future. And again, thank you.